Good afternoon and welcome to MedCity Invest Precision Medicine. I'm Stephanie Baum, Director of Special Projects with MedCity News. Before we get started, uh, let me give you an overview of, uh, of MedCity News. Founded in late 2008, MedCity News covers innovation and life sciences in healthcare. We cover biopharma, digital health, medical devices, diagnostics, as well as hospitals and payers in the context of the industry's overall transformation. We host conferences focusing on investment, population health, digital health, and patient engagement in addition to precision, precision medicine. Um, among the programs we have is, uh, one is a MedCity influencers program where contributors uh, can, uh, contribute thought leadership pieces. Uh, another is Med Citizens, which is a membership-based program uh, for startups, which uh, provides editorial and event benefits. If you have any questions about, uh, the, about Med Citizens or other programs we offer, you can contact me at sbaum at medcitynews.com. Another program we offer is uh, Med City Pivots, our podcast. Uh, you can listen to all our episodes on our website, uh, and you can, if you have any questions about that program or, or uh, feel you want to contribute, you can contact Arundhati Parmar, our editor-in-chief, at aparmar at medcitynews.com. I'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, Independence Blue Cross. Independence Blue Cross is the leading health insurance organization in southeastern Pennsylvania, and they've also been a longtime sponsor of MedCity events. I'd also like to thank uh, to our sponsor, JPOD, at University of Pennsylvania, which is part of j, &J Innovation. I'd also like to thank our partners, the University City Science Center, Startup Health, uh, MidAmerica Health Care Investors Network, Argo bon Pond Consulting, Health Wildcatters. And uh, now to our panel, reimbursement models for cell and gene therapy. Uh, our panelists include Lena Chaihorsky, uh, who's the co-founder and vice president of payer innovation at Alva 10, with a background in biology and mathematics from Tufts. Today, Lena leverages her extensive leadership experience in sales, national contracting, and all aspects of reimbursement to enable insurers and employers to optimize their therapeutic and downstream medical spending through use of innovative and novel diagnostics. Her work on commercial approaches to health economics data analysis led to her appointment as co-chair of the World Economic Forum's work group dedicated to the economics of rare disease data federations in 2019. She is active within the Tufts Alumni Career Networking Community and both a mentor and mentee within the Health Foundation C Sweetener, a 501c3 charity working toward healthcare equality, diversity and access by empowering women to seek and obtain mentorship from industry leaders. We also have Laura Akpala, Director of Reimbursement Policy with Gilead Sciences. Laura Akpala joined Gilead in October 2019. At Gilead, Ms. Akpala leads reimbursement strategy across Gilead's oncology portfolio, including driving the U.S. reimbursement strategy for the cell therapy franchise within Kite, a subsidiary of Gilead. Previously, Ms. Akpala spent over four years at AstraZeneca holding progressive roles on the U.S. and global government affairs and policy teams. Prior to joining AstraZeneca, Ms. Akpala spent nearly a decade as a consultant within small to medium-sized consultancies. In these roles, she supported biopharmaceutical and device companies in policy, advocacy, investor relations, communications, data analytics, and corporate strategy. Ms. Akpala holds a Master of Public Health degree from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and a Bachelor of Arts degree in Biology from Princeton University. Ms. Akpala is based in Washington, DC. And finally, uh, our third panelist is Mark Trusheim. He's the Strategic Director with New Digs at MIT Center for Biomedical Innovation. Mark Trusheim is where he also co-leads the financing and reimbursement of cures in the US or FOCUS 
project. And a, he's a visiting scientist at the MIT Sloan School of Management. Through MIT, he has also served as a special government employee for the FDA's Office of the Commissioner. Mark's research focuses on the economics of biomedical innovation, especially precision medicine, adaptive pathways, platform trials, and digital health advances. Prior to MIT, his career spanned big data at Keenan Systems, marketing at Searle Pharmaceuticals, eHealth as vice president of Monsanto Health Solutions, genomics as president of Syrian Genomics, and policy as the president of the Massachusetts Biotechnology Council. He holds degrees in chemistry from Stanford University and management from MIT. Welcome to the panel. Great to be with you. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. Okay. Um, so I just want to kind of give sort of a lay of the land uh, before we get started. Uh, as of February 2020, there were at least nine cell and gene therapy products approved in the U.S. Uh, spanning certain cancers, eye diseases, and rare hereditary diseases. Among them are Spark Therapeutics Luxturna for rare eye disease and other applications, Gilead CAR T drug uh, Yascarta for a large B cell lymphoma, and uh, Novartis's CAR T therapy Kimraya uh, for large B cell lymphoma, and uh, Gilead subsidiary uh, Kite. Uh, with their Tacartis uh, CAR-T therapy for mantle cell lymphoma. And uh, currently there are more than 500 cell and gene therapies currently in development, in clinical development. Um, so, um, you know, the, at the end of the day, the question is, how are we gonna pay for this? So uh, could you, each of you give a brief overview of the organizations you work for and your role in developing or collaborating on reimbursement models. Laura, maybe we start with you. Sure, absolutely. Um, and thank you, uh, Med City News, for the invitation to speak on today's panel. I'm excited to to talk about something that I spend a lot of time thinking about in my day job. So it's always good um, to, to sort of externalize uh, a lot of the activities and, and thinking that's uh, underpinning um, our work. So as you mentioned, Stephanie, uh, my name is Laura Akpala. I'm the Director of Reimbursement Policy here at Gilead, Gilead Sciences. Um, one of my core areas of focus is working to support the reimbursement strategy for KITE, which is our subsidiary that is solely focused on um, cell therapy and CAR-T. Um, we do have the, um, the only, uh, we are the only CAR-T franchise to have two and multiple products on the market. I think you mentioned them both, Yescarta for uh, adults with relapse refractory large B cell lymphoma and Tocardis, um, which has received accelerated approval uh, for relapse refractory mantle cell lymphoma. And, uh, you know, with both of these, I think, um, you know, bringing a transformative therapy to market has been, um, you know, a bit of a labor of love to, to get these uh, products to the patients that can, that are well, well served. Um, and I think, you know, in, you know, the, as a manufacturer and um, as someone that's you know, actively engaged in thinking about reimbursement and payment models for these, I think, you know, one of the areas where we always like to start our focus is just in the clinical data and the transformative nature of these therapies. Um, for example, when we think about diffuse large B cell lymphoma, we're going from a situation where these relapse refractory patients have few, if any, options and an overall survival of around six months um, to a situation where we just present at the American Society of Hematology annual meeting this weekend that from Zuma 1, one of our clinical trials for Yascarta, we actually saw 44% of patients um, were alive at, around, at four years. So that's an incredible sort of shift um, in terms of treatment for patients and 
just, you know, an incredible durable response. And so um, it, it's one of those things that as we think about reimbursement, it, it, I, I think it's critical that we don't lose the value story um, of these models and what they do. Um, and, you know, then the next question comes, how do we pay for them? And I think, you know, we'll talk more about that on this panel. So I won't take up all everyone's time at this point, because we'll get into it. But, um, you know, we are really looking to, to think through how do we ensure access, think about affordability, and, and be really creative about, um, you know, ensuring that patients have access to this type of innovation. Okay, Mark, or sorry, um, yeah, Mark. Oh, go ahead, Lena can go, go next, that'd be great. As the diagnostics voice, I'm, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to be third and maybe make it easier for everyone that way, that's great. Okay, then we're all so polite today. So, <laughs> uh, so again, Mark Trusheim from uh, the, the New Digs effort at MIT. Uh, new Digs looks at new paradigms for bringing biomedical innovations to, to the market. Uh, and we run a Think and Do Tank multi-stakeholder consortium uh, that include payers, developers, patients, uh, hospitals and f physicians and policymakers as, as well. And in focus, our Financing of Cures uh, consortium, we're looking to solve the financial challenges that these durable cell and gene therapies uh, create after you've already agreed on what the price or the reimbursement uh, should be. And so we've identified three key challenges that the first is the upfront payment uh, condensation of multiple years worth of benefit into one large payment upfront. Uh, the performance uncertainty regarding uh, these therapies, particularly around their durability will be for a lifetime for 10 years for five years, uh, certainly creates challenges. And also then uh, which was a surprise to many, the actuarial uncertainty this causes for payers, because most of these are in rare conditions where a single high cost uh, therapy in a given month uh, can really affect their income statements back and forth. So evening out that actuarial uncertainty is also important. And because no one financing solution uh, fits every product, every disease condition, and every payer type, We've had to develop uh, uh, as many as now five, what we call precision financing solutions that range from milestone-based contracts to performance-based annuities to subscription models and even warranties. Uh, so our, our group looks at these, tries to promote their use, understand some of their Im implementation challenges, data collection challenges, and really uh, find solutions that work for all the stakeholders and really harness that that multi-stakeholder power. Look forward to explaining more as the questions uh, lead us into the details. Lena? Great, thanks. Um, thanks again, Stephanie, for the invitation and pleasure to be with everyone today. Uh, my name is Lena Chaikorski, co-founder and vice president of Payer Innovation at Alva10. Um, Alva10 is a precision medicine brokerage. We essentially partner uh, insurance companies with pre-commercial diagnostic companies. And we look at the problem of therapeutic spend and utilization in a really different way. The question that we're asking is really not how much should these therapies cost. The question we're asking is in which patients will these therapies be and not be efficacious? And how do we develop diagnostics that guide that decision-making, not just for payers, um, but for patients and their families, as well as the large employers who also pick up a substantial portion of the bill. Um, so looking forward to presenting the diagnostic perspective and sort of representing that thought on the on the panel today and digging into the questions. Okay, great. Um, so my first question is uh, for Laura and, you know, slash Mark as well. You know, but I suppose Laura really initially, um, at what stage do you start conversations with with payers about reimbursement for some of these therapies? That's a great question, Stephanie. And, uh, you know, as we as we think about, you know, cell and gene therapies, we're really talking about uh, a really unique mechanism of action and methodology in terms of um, treatment. Um, from a CAR-T perspective, we're talking about taking a patient's own cells, um, taking them out of the patient, 
sending them off to manufacturing, re-engineering them, those cells and putting those back into patients to fight the cancer in question. And as we think about just how novel that is, um, it, it's really important to, to start there from an education perspective when you're talking to payers, because it's really a shift from um, a lot of the more traditional uh, treatment options that are available to patients. And so you really need to do that education early on, um, well before you, you launch a product. Um, and as you you tell that story and, and explain the novelty, um, that really underpins the broader value narrative. And that's what's really going to be critical when you start to think about um, pricing and reimbursement for these types of therapies. Because for payers, you're really going to need not only to educate them as to the value this brings to patients, as to you know how this um, can be transformative and sort of get patients to be you know functioning members of their society, for example. Um, but it's a learning experience for us as manufacturers as well. We need to understand where their priorities are. Um, and to ensure that there is that alignment and we're bringing them the evidence that they need to make informed decisions about how to cover and reimburse for these therapies. And so it's very critical that you start earlier, probably than you think, um, before lots to move these forward. Um, you know, I'll also say from a Medicare perspective, which is an area where, um, you know, for the few stars B cell lymphoma that's, you know, often um, often diagnosed into the 60s and, and Medicare is, uh, is obviously a very a key payer here. You know, you, there's a lot that needs to happen to establish reimbursement. And I'm sure we'll talk about sort of those processes a bit more later, but um, the earlier, the better is, is, is certainly um, where I would land on that question. Sure. Um, this is a question for all of you, but I'm, I'm guessing um, Mark probably is, is the target. Um, you know, Spark Therapeutics Gene Therapy looks turn off uh, for people with an inherited form of vision loss mm -hmm. uh, that can lead to blindness is a, a durable therapy. Uh, and uh, it was the, the first reimbursement model for a gene therapy based on outcomes. Um, what are some merits and challenges uh, to this approach? And is that the ideal for cell and gene therapy or is it a good first step? No, it was a great first step, um, and what it, what their milestone-based contract, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it was you pay a certain amount up front, and then if the therapy wasn't uh, beginning to show some effect after about 90 or 120 days, there might be some rebate, and then really uh, in a transformative way, they offered a 30-month, sometimes a 36-month, but generally a 30-month a uh, vision test uh, milestone, that then again, if the patient wasn't uh, responding well and passing that vision test, there'd be a rebate at that point. No, so two and a half years later, uh, based on the outcomes. And what that really helped facilitate was the discussion about value up front was it didn't have to be resolved at the time of launch necessarily and for each patient, but this milestone after two and a half years would allow some risk sharing between the developer and the payer uh, so they didn't have to argue quite so much and debate quite so much up front and that the actual product performance would resolve how much was finally the net reimbursement or the net price, if you will, for that therapy. And that's really one of these key challenges you heard me talk about before, this performance uncertainty. Um, you can either try to guess and negotiate up front exactly how it's going to work out or these outcome, longer term outcomes based contracts allow that just to resolve naturally. Uh, you still have to agree on what the value of the product will be if it works so that everybody's happy with that final price in the majority of cases where it will work. Uh, but that really helps with managing these differing expectations and fears between uh, both parties. Okay. Um, now, I know uh, one of the insurance companies that's developed uh, an interesting approach to dealing with the reimbursement issue uh, is Cigna. Uh, they developed a program that uh, where each member con contributes a certain amount each month that goes into a pool. And, uh, and then the sort of the therapies, the, the, the pool is tapped to sort of uh, provide the, uh, the funding for the, for, the, for the therapies as they're needed. And the idea, I think, is that because 
it's not like everybody and their brother is 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 taking these therapies uh, or needs these therapies. It's it's a it's a manageable uh, number of people uh, and and cost. Do you um ha- what what are what's your thoughts on that program, Mark? So that's a wonderful example of how you manage this actuarial volatility risk. Sure. What Cigna's uh, essentially offering is a new kind of pooled carve-out of approach, uh, where for a PM per quarter or per member per year fee, uh, each one of those payers gets as much gene therapy of the covered gene therapies as they need for their population. Uh, so it's a very budgetable, sure number for all these uh, uh, payers. And it's even stronger than what you suggested, Stephanie, because the, the clients don't contribute to a pool per se and then have to worry about whether the pool has enough funding or not. Cigna actually takes on that risk. And uh, they guarantee that no matter whether they price that too high or too low and they sort of run out of money, the rest of Cigna is on the hook for still providing all the gene therapy that those uh, payers, those client payers might might need. So it's really quite a strong product uh, in helping uh, those payers that are sensitive to this volatility, often mid-sized payers and certainly self-insured employers, that they have that uh, uh, budget consistency, no ability up front and can offer to all their members without doubt the benefits of these of these products. So it's a great access tool. It's a great financial management tool. Sure. And just at this point, I'd like to uh, invite our audience to, uh, if you have a question that you'd like to ask one of our panelists, uh, please submit it in the chat, and uh, and we will uh, we will we will try to answer as many questions as we can. Um, so. Uh, how, Laura, this is kind of a, I realize this is maybe a tough question, but how do biopharma companies determine how much a breakthrough therapy like CAR-T treatment will cost? I think that's a good question. You know, I think we, we started off this conversation talking a lot about the value, right? And and the clinical data that underpins any, any of this decision-making. Um, and we also talked about sort of the, the timing um, of really having these in-depth conversations very early on in, in the process. As we, we think about the pricing of these therapies, our approach is really grounded in that belief of uh, being driven by the value. And when we start to define and sort of break down what we mean by value, we need to sort of acknowledge and recognize that value means different things to different people, right? And so as we think about what pricing is and how we develop our price, we consult with patients, we consult with caregivers, we consult with clinicians, we consult with payers, we consult with other healthcare stakeholders, because they'll all have a really interesting perspective as to what's valuable and how, um, you know, how to weight sort of each of those criteria to inform where we land on price. And so all of those really take us um, from, you know, where we, you know, the clinical data and sort of the burden hand and sort of move us to really developing a price that allows us to externalize this product. Um, you know, I know that's sort of a circuitous sort of way to answer, but it's very complicated. And I think part of, part of why, you know, the pricing is so difficult is because of the inherent complexities in the healthcare system. When we think about traditional, traditionally how drugs are paid for, we're thinking about chronic treatment. We're thinking about over a long extended period treatment over and over again, reimbursement every single time. And, and that adds up. But when you think about cell and gene therapies, those, all those costs and all of that treatment happens up front. Yes, starter is a single one-time infusion, right? And then you get that durable response, um, you know, up to four years at this point. And, you know, that is really a, a paradigm shift when you think about the healthcare system that really isn't set up to deal with that sort of upfront cost that, you know, you get that value over time. So it makes it a little bit complicated. It makes that that sticker shock, you know, a little bit harsh for for many. But the reality is this is 
you know, a very different type of, of paradigm and treatment pattern and treatment journey for patients. So it's sort of thinking about all of those considerations when we uh, price our products. Sure. Okay. Um, now, Lena, uh, in our pre-panel, I just sort of want to bring you into the conversation. In our pre-panel chat, uh, you described diagnostics as the neglected stepchild of precision medicine. And first of all, True. why? <laughs> <laughs> sure. So I, I use that really to illustrate the fact that precision medicine, I would say healthcare in the U.S., honestly, values uh, treatment much more than it values diagnosis and prevention, which I think we can all see with the current pandemic situation. And that has over time created a financial ecosystem in which therapies are much more priced based on, the, on their value to Laura's points and diagnostics are priced on the basis of their cost. And that creates an equation in which a diagnostic that is priced at a couple hundred dollars is essentially responsible for determining which patients will or will not respond to therapies that are increasingly costing $100,000, $150,000, we see 300,000 with immunotherapies. Now we're seeing into the millions with the, with the cell and gene therapies. And no one's questioning the science. I mean, the science is absolutely breakthrough and paradigm changing that's brought these therapies to market. Um, but breakthrough science doesn't always lead to 100% efficacy. And that's really where diagnostics need to sort of come out of the shadows as being that stepchild of healthcare and, um, and start getting valued and commercialized and priced appropriately so that it can effectively guard the gate to these drugs and more effectively lead patients, very importantly, that will respond to these drugs to these drugs and ensure that the patients that can respond have that access. And that access is fully backed up by all the payer entities we were discussing earlier. Sure. I mean, do you see... Do you see increasingly uh, diagnostics uh, being covered as, you know, maybe a companion diagnostic as part of, you know, gaining access to cell and gene therapies? Um, and in that way, maybe, maybe getting a little bit regarded a little bit more favorably than the stepchild you refer to? You know, it's an interesting question. I think for the most part, companion diagnostics are covered when that diagnostic is on the label of the drug. So they're covered by the payer. So that's sort of a, a standard. Um, I think the problem really comes into play in terms of how that's paid out. Um, so you can have a payer that's covering a companion diagnostic and covering the drug. The diagnostic is reimbursed at $190. The drug is reimbursed at $150,000. That creates very difficult economics for the labs and hospitals that are trying to run that diagnostic and have to be able to obtain some sort of return on investment for running that test prior to getting the, you know, prior to assigning the drug to the patient. So I think in general, the payment systems for the two of them are very different because diagnostics historically fall under the medical benefit, whereas pharmaceutical drugs always fall under the pharmacy benefit. And insurance companies have always looked at those two things as separate, as two different pockets. Um, so I think it's an ongoing conversation for, for us with our payer partners and with the industry in general to say that optimizing your therapeutic spend is identifying to the greatest extent possible and use, utilizing diagnostics to determine in which patients drugs will and will not be efficacious. This changes a little bit with cell and gene therapies we're because we're talking about very different technologies, but just a couple of examples, like when we think about the Luxterna example that was just given, Luxterna essentially works in patients that have a, that have a mutation on both alleles. It's a biallelic mutation that patient can clinically present as somebody that looks like they might need Luxterna, but if they don't have that biallelic mutation, they're not a candidate for Luxterna. And it's a diagnostic test that will tell you, you know, that will look at the patient's genome and tell you whether or not that patient has a biallelic mutation. So that's an example of a diagnostic driving to or from drug efficacy, depending. It also enables um, us as a society to determine who should be a candidate for Luxterna. But another example in cell and gene therapy is in sort of how diagnostics interact that's a little bit different from the traditional companion diagnostic that we think about today um, is when we think about some of these new gene therapies, the fact, the, the way that they are delivered, the 
the way that that therapeutic payload, if you will, is delivered into the body is through an adenovirus. So this is technology that, that, we, that we know about, um, but essentially an adenovirus, these are usually groups of like very well characterized viruses. But if a person has previously been exposed to one of those adenoviruses, they have antibodies, right? That when that therapy comes in with its payload on the back of an adenovirus, your body is going to use those antibodies and attack it. And that payload will not be delivered. And that drug is not going to be delivered to, to, to the human system. And so that's another example where we have to provide diagnostic information before we can apply the drug. We have to make sure that that patient has an optimal efficacy profile for that therapeutic. And this, this can go on, there are other examples, but essentially the main point I'm trying to make is that when we think about companion diagnostics, we think about you know, very linear sort of, is this mutation on the FDA package insert label of the drug? But the value of diagnostics in essentially being the GPS of healthcare here and determining which patients should and should not get these really expensive therapies and also opening the market for pharma to come in and create new therapies for those patients that are non-responders, right, to the therapy they just launched. That's a broader sort of academic ecosystem of diagnostics, which I think we're really starting to see come to fruition now in the healthcare system, because frankly, we've, we've hit that point of no return economically, right? We're talking about million dollar therapies, an enormous pipeline, like you mentioned. Um, so we need to make sure our diagnostic strategy is robust to be able to uh, stand as a checks and balances, if you will, to what's coming down the pike. Sure. And Stephanie, if I could jump in for sure. a moment, there's also a huge opportunity for diagnostics to be developed for legacy therapies, where Absolutely. patients are, uh, we know legacy therapies are often only 20% efficacious. For, for patients, and yet they go through six months worth of therapy or a year worth of therapy where their condition gets worse, making it more expensive to treat with good therapies that they will respond to. Um, and also, if you could save that spending on these legacy therapies, it would open headroom in the healthcare system to pay for the more effective therapies, which would also be more effective because they're giving to the patient sooner as opposed to the current step therapy kind of processes going through. And yet the incentives for developing those diagnostics are very low because of this historic 1960s or 70s CMS decision to pay for diagnostics on a time and motion basis that every immunoassay is worth $35. Right? That's exactly for this, right. Whether it's going to be something that changes the course of a patient's history or whether it's just an immunoassay that you know, is somewhat informative and helpful. There's no sense of value in that reimbursement. And that's just a real uh, sadness for patients that wind up not getting the best therapy faster because we have so few incentives for Lena's uh, uh, payers to pay that way and for the diagnostic companies to be able to really meet this incredible need, but there's no financial incentive for it. So it just doesn't happen. Sure. Laura, any thoughts on that? I don't actually have a lot of thoughts. Um, you know, we don't, you know, right now, CAR T is there's no diagnostic um, that's used along with our therapies. It's really, you know, taking your own cells and, and putting them back into you. So um, it's a little bit different. But, you know, to, to the point here, I think there's always um, additional investigation into, you know, who doesn't respond. Um, and that's only going to inform uh, future conversations around, uh, you know, therapeutic development. Sure. Well, we have a, a question from the audience, um, and uh, I'm not sure who the best person to take this is, so, so feel free to jump right in uh, when I ask it. What problems can be envisioned with subscription plan contracts between payer and pharma? Can these new innovative reimbursement models reduce commercialization costs uh, slash marketing costs of new therapeutics? So I'll jump in on that one to start with. So the subscription model, which is where you pay a fixed fee for sort of unlimited access to things. So you saw the insurance kind of product from Cigna that offers that going forward. Um, it's difficult for companies to offer that directly for some arcane Medicaid best pricing sort of rules and impediments. But it's also uh, difficult to know exactly in some conditions what the eligible population is going to be, particularly when there's alternative therapies in place. So Cigna's offered this for 
uh, two gene therapies for which there's really not alternative treatments, the Lexterna product that you talked about and Zolgensma for, for SMA. Uh, but if you move into hemophilia, for instance, you don't know that the first gene therapies when they get approved are gonna be right for everyone. And there's some alternative therapies that are pretty efficacious. And frankly, some hemophiliacs are quite happy with their current factor, prophylactic factor uh, regimens. And you don't wanna have an incentive where all of a sudden for a subscription price, people who are comfortable with their uh, current more chronic therapies are directed into the, oh, now you should take the gene therapy because you're essentially free. I've paid a fixed price for that. And now the insurance companies or others, the providers would have phenomenal incentive to direct people into that. Or the opposite would happen. The providers would have less interest in doing that because they make a markup off of one of the other products and not off the subscription. So it's very condition and sort of uh, 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 competition uh, sensitive for all this. And on the commercial side, there are some federal regulations that make subscription models offered by manufacturers very difficult to, uh, to move forward with. I hope they found that helpful. Maybe they'll give you a comment back as to whether that was the kind of response they were looking for or not. We don't tend to get that much like instantaneous reaction, but, um, but I'll, you know, we'll see. Um, so one question I just kind of wanted to add to this mix is, now, what do we do? So, so say someone, uh, you know, receives a, a seller gene therapy through their employer, it's reimbursed, is covered, um, but then they change jobs because of the way our, our healthcare system works. What what happens next, Mark? What do, what do, or, and how is your think tank working to sort of solve those problems? So there's stronger and weaker forms of solutions to that, right? Yeah. The weakest form is what we do for. Uh, statins today and diabetes care that every payer says, well, I'll cover mine and you cover yours and they'll sort of move back and forth and it'll sort of pay for itself. You know, it'll all work out in, in, in the end. But these long-term performance outcomes contracts make that harder because of HIPAA and other uh, impediments. It's difficult to track the patient. So they've moved, you know, across the country. How do I find out what, what they're doing? And they're there are some solutions around data interoperability down at the very lowest levels, but there's also some clever contracting things that are possible where uh, you basically set up a standard uh, approach, call it like a 60 month car loan. Everybody agrees I'm gonna do a 60 month car loan, a 60 month out outcomes contract. Uh, and they keep all their confidential information about the pricing and this and that. But they say, when somebody moves from my plan to your plan, I'll simply tell you they're in year three, and then you pick up the outcomes contract from there on. Uh, and I know you've got the same sort of five-year thing. Don't know exactly where you set your pricing, et cetera. I don't need to know, but now it's yours and you'll get the rebate if that happens. And when they come to me, you'll tell me that they're in year two and I'll pick it up back and forth. And we had a, a, a number of Massachusetts payers willing to do exactly that for for one of these these products and again for some other reasons it didn't launch but they were all on board with that kind of swapping minimal information to enable these longer term outcomes contracts so there are some clever approaches and there's a number of insurers that are thinking they can play the uh, the, the middle role and they actually hold the outcomes risk back and forth and the, and they have a bigger pool of patients so it's easier uh, for them to, to track who's, who's going where. So there's some clever approaches uh, and uh, we have great hopes. There's also a certain amount of practicality. None of these are ever gonna be perfectly just systems. And so if you're looking for something where no one will ever lose, well, that's never gonna happen. It doesn't happen in any other contracting we do in, in healthcare. So there's a certain amount of practicality that we also see. Those, those seeking perfect justice in healthcare reimbursement uh, it's a nice academic talking point, but in reality, you know, there are some, some practical ways to move forward on, on this. And, sure. and Mark, just to, to quickly add to that, you know, I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of some of the challenges that we're running to in the U.S. when thinking about, you know, particularly outcomes-based model and the portability of the data. You know, at Kite, we, we actually have some outcomes-based agreements in Europe. Um, and obviously in those markets where you have a single payer, 
you know, you can do a little bit more, right? Mm -hmm. you, you don't have those uh, challenges. Um, I know, Mark, you and I have, have talked about, um, you know, potentially thinking through what models could look like in the Medicare program. You know, that, that's another population that's a bit more static that, uh, you know, you don't have to deal with, um, you know, many of the challenges with the patients shifting, you know, they're a Medicare patient after 65, right? So, um, it, you know, there, there's challenges and opportunities. And a lot of that, I think that speaks, Mark, to some of what you said early on, like these models, it's, it's not one size fits all. Um, you really have to look at the, the context, the, the, the product itself, its clinical profile, the population it serves, and all of that feeds into the opportunities and challenges with each of these. Right. And there's also some very creative things. I'll uh, tell Kite's uh, uh, creativity in this space as well, that there's opportunities that have been discussed that, you know, if you have a good response after a year or two, you're likely to have a very good response farther out. So that collapses the amount of time that you really have to have in the outcomes basis uh, for, for all this. So the, the more that we, we, we learn, the more feasible these things can, can be. But there's, uh, to Laura's point, um, not every payer is the same. Not every product hits the same kinds of payers. So the SMA is very much a Medicaid and commercial product with no Medicare. The cancer things tend to be much more Medicare, of course, as we get cancers as, as we age. Uh, great points, Laura. Thank you so much. Um, so, Mark, how, what place do self-insured employers have at the, in this discussion uh, at, uh, in, in, the, in the talks that you have uh, and, and the, the, the different organizations that you're working with? So... Self-insured employers, for those who don't know, now make up about half of the commercial lives that are covered, right? So even though it might be administered by Blue Cross Blue Shield or Aetna or Cigna or any of these others, it's really the companies themselves that are that are paying for this. So they face uh, even more so this actuarial challenge, right? Can you imagine a $2 million charge coming to a thousand per employee company? So there's a second layer of insurance that they often buy called stop loss insurance that says any cost over 50,000 or 100,000, or they sometimes go as high as a couple hundred thousand dollars, the stop loss insurer will simply pay for that. So in the short term, many of the self-insured employers don't really care whether it costs a million or $5 million. They just say my stop loss insurance is gonna pay for that and I'm covered, I've paid my premium. Uh, then they complain when the rates go up right, the next year and the year after that, and they don't always make that connection. Unfortunately, those are all historically been one-year stop-loss insurance contracts, which then makes anything that's a multi-year performance-based contract very difficult in that environment because companies may switch their stop-loss insurer every year. Uh, the stop-loss insurers tend not to be involved in the negotiation process for the price of the therapy, which is still done through the standard pharmacy benefit manager or, or the third-party ad administrator. Uh, so it's been a real challenge to find new creative solutions for the self-insured em em employer market that can really respond in a flexible way. Right now, because there's so few products, uh, it hasn't become a big issue, but I know those stop loss insurers are thinking about offering multi-year contracts so that as this category grows, they can become more engaged in, in, in that, that process. So we'll see how, how that evolves. It's a real opportunity uh, for uh, downstream innovation to make these scientifically transformative therapies more uh, available in an easier way. Sure. Um, so I just want to touch on one thing that you and Laura touched on a little bit earlier, looking at the European market and their approach to sort of how they decide which uh, cell and gene therapies they're going to they're going to cover. Obviously, it's a different, a completely different health system. Everything is 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 uh, theoretically paid for. Uh, so how does what are you seeing in the way of how they're picking and choosing which therapies, which cell and gene therapies to cover and why? I'll quickly just start um, and, and say, you know, when you think about these models, um, you really need to, and the way that we think about them at Kite, it's really about facilitating patient access, affordability, standing behind the outcomes of our products, and thinking about healthcare sustainability. 
right, and system sustainability, and, and considering all of those factors when, when thinking about when to enter into these arrangements. Um, when you think about, you know, these types of um, models, you know, innovative payment models or, or new sort of payment mechanisms, it really starts with, um, you know, the relationship between the manufacturer and the payer. Um, and, you know, the manufacturer oftentimes needs to be a proactive partner um, in, in those conversations and really sort of think about when does this make sense, when does it not, what are the risks of entering into this agreement, you know, what are the risks of not entering in the, into this agreement, which may mean no access in certain markets, right? And so, you know, it's really critical that we sort of focus on, you know, those pillars around access and, and outcomes and sustainability and really focus our efforts there. And those tend to be sort of the guiding light when we think about when it makes sense to enter these agreements and not, whether it's in the European markets or whether it's in any sort of market in the U.S. I think we always sort of ground in that way. And I would add to that, as Laura mentioned before, the many of the European countries, since they uh, cover the entire population for their lifetime in a single payer approach, they have more flexibility on how they might use some of these financing approaches to manage their actuarial and their performance and their payment risk over time. Uh, it really comes down to discussions of value. You have to remember in at least a number of the European countries, access to healthcare is a constitutional right, right? It's in their constitution that they have to have access to appropriate healthcare for all that. And yet against that, the Europeans also have to balance their affordability and value and pricing discussions. Uh, so it's quite a complex uh, process that they have in place, that they try to manage those rights versus what they perceive as the affordability to their to their healthcare systems. And Mark, yeah. that, that right is not extended, to, you know, it's not a right to every single therapy. It's not a right to every single option, but it is a right to the healthcare. So, you know, oftentimes as a manufacturer, you have to think about, you know, it. not every market will have access to every single drug. Um, and, you know, you do have to be proactive in thinking about what makes the most business sense, but most importantly, what makes the most sense from a patient perspective in getting this medicine to patients. Yeah. Um, so, for example, in the, in the oncology fields, many of the European countries say, well, we give you access to on oncology care, but maybe not every product or exactly. type of care uh, in there. But when you have a uh, single mutation genetic condition, and there's only one therapy for that, then it's a different kind of discussion. So again, it goes product by product, condition by condition, and how the uh, uh, European health authority, the countries, there's not a, all Europe, but each country's health authority thinks of what are the therapeutic options for that patient. And then those discussions have a different flavor to them. Sure. sure. Um, so just to change the channel a little bit a bit, um, Lena, your company, Elva One, recently embarked on a collaboration with a Belfast company, speaking of Europe, uh, called Diaceutics in a quest to fix the broken testing system. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Um, so Diaceutics is a really a global leader in the precision medicine space. They've actually worked on every precision medicine that has come to market thus far, I believe. Mm -hmm. And as a result, that's given them a really unprecedented view of all of the different holes through which diagnostics and precision therapies can fall through on their way to patient access. So what they are doing to fix that problem and patch those holes, if you will, is they created um, something called the DXRX network, which Alva 10 is now probably a part of. DXRX is essentially the first global network that connects stakeholders, pharma, lab, diagnostics, um, government payers, private payers, um, in an ecosystem that enables them to collaborate with each other to obtain in order sort of to the goal of greater market access for precision medicines and diagnostics. But it also connects that ecosystem of stakeholders with service providers like Alva 10, who can come in and help fix the very specific issues that diagnostics and precision therapies and diagnostics in particular see on their way to market. Um, test development, validation, education, um, coverage and reimbursement, obviously, and all of those financial systems that govern, again, the U.S. being a very different situation than a lot of other countries 
in the world, um, sort of those financial incentives or systems that govern how a diagnostic and a drug come to market either together or separately and how they are used either together or separately. So I would, I, I think it's a really innovative program. Um, I think we're going to see this bear fruit for years to come. Um, and I think as we all, as precision medicine stakeholders, get more comfortable with precision medicine therapies and the diagnostics that drive their understanding of efficacy or lack of efficacy, I think we're going to get more fluent as a society. But because precision medicine is still new, we don't, to Mark's earlier point, you know, when a lot of the, the drugs that we now think of as being the most expensive drugs in the world, you know, Humira, excellent example, 20 billion a year, when those drugs were first approved, we didn't have the technologies to determine whether in which patients that drug was going to be efficacious. And it's not always true that we have that technology right when the drug comes to market, but we as a diagnostic industry, because the technology has evolved, we've gotten so much better at that. And now as a healthcare ecosystem, we need to get so much more fluent at partnering that diagnostic with that precision therapy, because that ultimately is what changes the outcome in the patient. You know, to Laura's point, value is defined differently by, by different stakeholders. Um, patients want to make sure that their co-pays are going to a drug that is going to work for them. Um, it's a huge area of financial toxicity for patients. And this is another thing I think we'll be able to, to uh, hopefully improve along the road of better patient access for precision. And that can provide confidence to those patients that they should take a risk at what they think might be a more expensive therapy for them as, as well. Absolutely. It works both ways, right? It's not just about uh, not uh, uh, giving therapy to those who you know won't respond. It's also about encouraging those who could benefit to have the courage to move forward with, with that because the diagnostic reinforces that this therapy will really work for you. And therefore the benefit risk ratio, whether it's medical risk or financial toxicity risk, that calculation changes for those patients. Absolutely. And I do think we're going to start to see maybe a little bit of change in the nomenclature. I think for a long time as an industry, we thought of drugs and precision medicines, right? And we sort of drew this line. And I think that's really going to change because now we understand that almost all drugs are precision medicines. I mean, every therapy that's been developed for the past 30, 40 years works along a specific and known mechanism of action, right? That can then be um, identified by a diagnostic process. So I think, I, I think again, as a healthcare ecosystem, we're gonna to start to look at the word precision medicine a little bit differently and really start to apply the principles of precision medicine to medicine across the board as well we should. Um, okay. Um, so as we're getting towards the, the end of the hour, um, just a reminder to the audience, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to share them in the chat. Um, you know, sort of where do you guys expect reimbursement models to be in a year's time, five years time? Will the health care industry be prepared for multiple cell and gene therapies to hit the market all at once? I can start. Um, I'm sure others will have uh, some different perspectives. Um, I, you know, as we start to, first I'll take a step back, right? When uh, Yaskarta first launched in 2017, the first CAR-Ts made it to market. Um, many of them were inpatient based, had a very significant Medicare population. We really had to work to transform the system. We went from, um, you know, an inpatient bundled episodic payment of um, a base payment of around $40,000 at that time when these uh, adult CAR-T therapies cost $373,000. You know, that's a, a pretty big delta, right? And so even though there are sort of mechanisms to make that up, you know, not having predictable and adequate Medicare reimbursement really limited access for these patients. Um, you know, fast forward to this current sort of fiscal year in the Medicare inpatient program, and CMS has done a significant amount of work to improve that sort of baseline um, episodic uh, bundled payment and has brought it up to $240,000. But again, that's still, you know, well below the, the value-based price of $373,000 for these therapies. And so, you know, as again, back to sort of our original concepts and thinking around, you know, does these, do these, uh, does the existing healthcare payment system 
um, make sense for these types of therapies, it, it, it continues to be a challenge for us. And so, um, you know, I think that's why it's so critical that, that we start to think about having these uh, types of conversations around what sort of alternative payment models or innovative payment models may make sense for these therapies, just to make sure that even in the current state, that they are adequately reimbursed and reimbursement is not uh, a barrier to access for patients. And then as we take the next step, it's about being much more forward looking. Um, we're looking, you know, you, you talked about the number of um, uh, cell and gene therapies and clinical development at the start of this call. And we're, we're going to see those come to fruition. There's more and more data. Um, there's, you know, just more information out there about the value these therapies bring to patients. And the question then becomes, how do we create a sustainable system? Um, I think there's going to be a lot more focus on outcomes. Let's pay for what works and not, and, and you know, not pay for what doesn't work. I think we're, we're going to have to be creative. We're going to have to, as drug manufacturers, stand behind the value of our products and stand behind the clinical data and say, you know, we believe that this is what is, you know, sort of the best treatment for patients and we're willing to put dollars on the line for that. Um, and, you know, I think, I think it's going to be exciting to see what happens, but it, you know, I think it would be a bit naive to rest on our laurels. And that's why I'm glad we have, you know, folks like Mark and, and New Digs and others and Lena just thinking about what that next generation or what the next iteration of reimbursement frameworks are going to look like. Okay, Lena? Um, I think that, I think that the... <laughs> Um, I definitely think that the system needs to have all of the therapies available as a result of the incredible breakthrough science that pharma has been, has been working on. Absolutely. Um, bring it on, seriously. I mean, I think the science is, is absolutely amazing. Hopefully some of the costs will come down as pharma becomes more comfortable with some of the R&D processes that first led to some of these first therapies. At the end of the day, I, 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 re I don't think it's a conflict at all. I think it's just a question of as the therapies come to market, how good and how fluent are we as an ecosystem into identifying the patients who will respond and who will, who will not respond to these therapies? I, I really think that's, that's what it's about. Um, you know, we can talk about what the cost of the therapy should be and would it be easier for the system if they were all very cheap? Sure, it would be. And probably many of them wouldn't exist if that was true because pharma has to recoup their R&D costs and everyone understands that. So I think absolutely. Um, as a healthcare system, we need to keep seeing these therapies come to market. We just need to be asking questions that are not just how much the therapy is going to cost. We're, we need to be asking questions around efficacy as well. And, and, and that's what we're doing as a system. So I think we're moving forward for sure. Mark? These sorts of reimbursement approaches are going to go from exceptional for only the highest uh, cost products because capturing outcomes today is, a, is an expensive process to now as there's more of these products coming forward, it's going to go from a one, one off to it's sort of this, a more standard way to do it for these uh, durable cell and gene therapies. And then I think within seven, eight, nine years, you're going to see it really spill over into uh, the majority of therapies that are new and particularly in these rare con conditions. Uh, and even go beyond that, as Lena has has talked about, because it's going to go from uh, an exceptional process to everyone's going to be, of course, this is how one should do this. And the costs of collecting the data are going to come down. And therefore, the ability to implement these uh, uh, kinds of arrangements is going to spread. Uh, we've often seen that orphan therapies uh, lead the way and then other therapies sort of follow over, over time, and I expect that's what's going to happen here too. And we're going to thank Laura and all the pioneers for taking all the arrows of education and implementation challenges to sort of open up the, the, the frontier of this for us. So thank you, Laura, for all the work that you guys are doing. We actually have one more question uh, from the audience. Um, how has cost of care changed with people living longer due to these newer treatments, especially with ongoing care costs? Who wants to tackle that one? So I can I can try um, from one perspective, which I think just based on you know our conversations with payers, this is obviously an ongoing an ongoing discussion. 
Um, and I think it was, maybe it was one of the head medical directors at Intermountain a couple of years ago that stood up and said, look guys, we ran a cost effectiveness, effectiveness analysis and guess what? Our patients live two years longer and everything costs twice as much, right? Like what did, what did you think we were gonna say? Of course that's the case. But the way I really think about this honestly is, um, is in terms of costs, costs per year of life but also payers can also think about this in terms of how much money am I spending per patient for how many months of life in oncology, for example, where sometimes, unfortunately, we have to count in months and not years. Um, what does that What does that mean for me? It, it's like a it's like a it's a, it's a mileage per gallon question essentially. So I think that enables payers to look at the situation a little bit differently. Cost of care can go up in many instances. Um, but if the survival is dramatically more then the cost effectiveness of that intervention is, uh, is improved over the, over the status quo. So I think that's a really important distinction between looking at things in terms of total costs and looking at things in terms of cost per month of life. You know, Humana has this great concept, number of healthy days. They want to increase number of healthy days. How much are you spending per healthy day? And what kind of a healthy day runway have you given that patient? Um, I think those are really key questions to talking about value and total cost of care. And that's a great answer. Thank you, Lena. Mark, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, only that I'm reminded of the tobacco companies in the 1980s that said uh, they were saving the federal government money in Medicare because people with lung cancer died earlier and sooner and they ought to have more people smoking, right? <laughs> so uh, I think when you phrase it that way and remember that, uh, uh, we'll find a way to uh, uh, care for people and, and who wants people to die sooner and cheaper, right? Which is the opposite of what that argument would, would, would say. So I think Lena's uh, said it in a much more positive and, and, and great way. So I think she, she had the, the good answer, but I can't see anybody arguing that they'd really rather have people die. Okay, um, just, and just as we're wrapping up, um, do, do what, what is kind of like one takeaway from this conversation that you would like uh, audience members to uh, take away from this conversation? Uh, Laura? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll say that, um, you know, these therapies, cell and gene therapies are really transforming um, how patients are being treated. They're extending life um, for a, a long period of time. They're just really transformational. And I think, you know, critical to any part of the discussion about payment is just that fundamental understanding. Um, and then I think the tough questions is how do we create a sustainable framework uh, for these therapies? And I, and I hope that all of the smart minds on this call, um, both our panelists, um, as well as, you know, all the listeners can, can be a part of that conversation and, and help sort of, uh, make the, the right paradigm shifts to get us to where we, we need to be um, to make sure every patient that, that is appropriate gets access. I would simply close with, we're now in an era where innovation in payment structures and approaches is beginning to match the kind of innovation that we have in the transformative science for, the, for these patients. And that successfully providing patient access and, and benefit requires both kinds of innovation, not just the scientific in innovation. And that uh, all of us are rising and the creativity is there that we're going to succeed just as the science has succeeded the payment in innovation is also moving forward and having success okay lena i would agree with all those points i think we're seeing a new chapter in healthcare in which we're being really challenged to um to match the amount of money we're spending with what we're getting for that money. And I think we've been asking much more critical questions um, of that area than we ever have before. I think that that's good. I think that's great for all parties. And I think that that kind of pressure will always, um, will always yield greater innovation, both scientific innovation and business model innovation, which I absolutely agree is what we need to really enable that, to enable us to afford that scientific innovation in the future. 
Well, on that note, uh, I'd like to thank uh, each of you, Laura, Mark, and Lena, for taking the time uh, to participate in this panel discussion. I've really enjoyed the conversation. And I hope our audience has as well. Thank you so much to our speakers and our audience. We look forward to seeing you at the next MedCity Invest Precision Medicine session.